Back right here, it is the Jake Asman Show, 98.7 ESPN New York. Jake Asman taking you till midnight. Jets and the Giants tomorrow at MetLife Stadium, the debut of Aaron Rodgers as the Jets quarterback. And joining us right now is a former New York Jets defensive lineman, former New York Jets analyst on SNY. Now you check him out on ESPN calling college football and, oh, yeah, covering the NFL for CBS Sports HQ. He is Leger Doosable, and he joins us now. Leger, always great to catch up, my man. I hope all is well. Everything is well, um, Jake. You know, a lot going on. College football week zero kicks off this week. So it's busy, man. But football is back. You have to love it. Aaron Rodgers is back. Uh, Lejay, I, I got to yeah. start there, man. I, I'm nervous as a Jet fan getting set <laughs> to watch this game played. tomorrow. <laughs> you know I'm scared. So I uh, kind of break this down. I mean, Rodgers wants to play. Yeah. Salah wants him to play. Your thoughts as a former player on Rodgers going out there with the starters against the Giants? Yeah, it made a lot of sense. And I think. Rodgers had come out earlier in training camp and said, if Robert Soller wants me to play, you know, the third week of the preseason, I'm all for it. And I think he's actually excited to get out there because we know this, Jake, Aaron Rodgers does have some freedom in this offense, right? And we've seen, you know, clips, whether it's on hard knocks or one jet drive. We heard Randall Cobb, you know, be vocal about it to the other receivers. Like, you guys continue to mess up. Eight won't throw you the ball. So, you need some of that in game action, right? Where he makes some adjustments at the line of scrimmage, gives you a hand signal. He needs to make sure everybody's on on you know on the same page when those live bullets are going. So it made a lot of sense, right? Because Rodgers has been in Green Bay his whole career, it's his first year here with the uh, the New York Jets, and yes, he's very familiar with the offense because he was with Nathaniel Hackett, you know, when he had back to back MVP seasons. But now you got Garrett Wilson, you got Tyler Conklin, you got a new offensive line, and this communication that has to be had. That's key for your progression throughout the season. So the only way to get better at that is do it in live game action. Yes, it counts in practice, but it's a lot different when those it's unscripted. You know what I'm saying, Jake? And he has to call it off the cuff. So I think that's what Aaron Rodgers was thinking when he was like, you know, I'm excited to play in this game. I, you know, I kind of want to play in this game just so we can get those nuances out. Go, I kind of have like a rough run through is before we get ready for the regular season. Lejay, I can't speak. Lejay Doosable is joining us here at 98.7 ESPN. Former Jets defensive lineman played under Robert Sala when Robert Sala was the defensive coordinator with the San Francisco 49ers. So, Lejay, let me ask you this about Robert Sala because there's all this hype and expectations surrounding this Jets team. Is he the right kind of guy? Is he the right coach to lead this team back to the playoffs, to lead this team maybe to a Super Bowl, right? You know him better than most. Your thoughts on Robert Sala entering a huge year three? Definitely, I believe so. And I felt like they were a, a near playoff team last year with the issues they had at the quarterback position. And I think that's how you can tell if a guy is right for the job. You know, when things aren't going well, how does the team respond, right? Even though, you know, the Jets had struggles at the quarterback position, this team still came out and fought every week, right? I mean, I believe it was six games, Jake, that they lost by one score or less. So just imagine, even if you just split those in half, right? You get a 10-win Jet team, they're in the playoffs, right? So I think there's kudos to be had, not just for Robert Sala, but Joe Douglas for the, the the group of players he's put together on this team, right, to try to build this thing the right way. And the thing about Robert Sala, I can tell you, he's 100, 100% authentic. Like the guy that you guys see out on that podium, the guy that you, you know, see running up and down the stadium stairs, the guy that you see with all the excitement on the sideline, that is 100% the embodiment of Robert Sala, right? And I thought it was weird that a lot of people, you know, watched Hard Knocks and thought that, quote unquote, Robert Sala doesn't hold players accountable. What he doesn't do is throw people under the bus, but he holds his players accountable and he holds them to a standard. You always hear him talk about, we played our brand of football and there's a standard that comes with that. So he holds players accountable, but players love him, right? Because he doesn't throw players under the bus, right? But they go out there and they run through a brick wall for him. So I believe Robert Sala is the guy to, to lead the Jets back to the uh, the playoffs, and they have the right quarterback now to do that. We know what that defense is. I think the defense has only gotten better since, you know, being a top four defense last year. Did you enjoy his speech about the Crow and the Eagle, if you got a chance to watch Robert Sala on Hard Knocks, yeah, Lachey? I did watch that, and I, I thought that was a great way to open up Hard Knocks, right? And it makes a lot of sense, right? A Crow isn't really, you know, worried. I mean, an uh, Eagle isn't worried about a Crow, right? Because at the end of the day, once it soars, you know, to different lengths, a crew, a crow can't breathe up there. So it's a great analogy as far as, like, 
shutting out the outside noise, right? Don't worry about all these crows. We're trying to soar like eagles. So that was great. And that's the thing about Saul. He always has little tidbits like that. Like, I, I think something that was interesting with him when I was with him his first year as D coordinator, every day we came in, he always had a brain teaser. He always had us thinking, right? And that was just to get us up and going for meetings before we went out to practice. And that's and you saw a little bit of that, you know, in, in Hard Knocks with that meeting, with those analogies that he had in the Hard Knocks opening scene. This is what he does on a day in and day out basis. Like, that wasn't just for Hard Knocks. That is who Robert Sala is day in and day out. Leger Duzable, former Jets defensive lineman, now CBS Sports HQ analyst, is my guest here on the Jake Asman Show. It's ESPN 98.7 FM, taking you till midnight tonight. Jets Giants in the preseason, final game for each team at MetLife Stadium. And Leger, a lot of talk about this Jets offense, of course, but how about the Jets defense? I want to hear your thoughts as a former Jets defensive lineman about the current state of this defensive line. All we hear all summer is Jermaine Johnson looks amazing and he's going to break out. I know you loved him coming out of Florida State. Your thoughts on Jermaine and the rest of that defensive line now in a huge year with Robert Sala, of course, the head honcho in charge. Yeah, speaking of Jermaine Johnson, looks like he could have a bigger role earlier in the season than we initially thought. Now, we knew he was going to get an uptick in, in plays, right? He was around like 30% last year. I already said coming into this year, he's probably going to be around 40 45%. But we don't know what the status of Carl Lawson is right now. And there is rumors that he could potentially miss week one. So it looks like Jermaine could be starting week one opposite of John Franklin Myers. So uh, just talking to Jermaine, and I went out there to Spartanburg in the cross practice with the Carolina Panthers, just seeing him, how he's transformed his body, right? We already knew he was a physical guy. And that's a lot, a lot of people don't talk about that. And I, and I said this during the draft. To me, he was the best run stuff and defensive end in the draft. Like, he played more physical than any other deep edge guy coming out in that class last year. So we already knew he was a great run defender. We see that physicality throughout training camp. We saw it versus the Carolina Panthers. But I think he's taking this game to the next level when it comes to getting after the quarterback. Like, there's been times during training camp he's been unblockable. There were times during, I believe, he only had 11 snaps in that Carolina Panthers game. He was unblockable in that game at times. And that was their starting offensive lineman. So – he was one of my breakout players. I had it on CBS Sports uh, HQ. He was one of my breakout players this year, and I think he's going to take the proverbial step because most players, you see the most most growth from players from year one to year two. I think he's going to fit into that mode. And then you look at what they've done in the back. I mean, Tony Adams is a guy. I've been singing his praises since the beginning of training camp. Robert Sala found, found a gym last year. Played really well for the Jets down the stretch. And he's, one, he's a rare – thing to have back there because he's one of the few safeties the Jets have that have the playmaking ability as far as going to get the ball out of the year, right? As far as having a true ball hawk, that's what Tony Adams is. And a lot of people will kind of scratch their head like, why isn't this kid playing? Well, you don't want to get your one true ball hawk, put him in a position where he potentially could get hurt. Now he'll go out there and play this week because all the starters are playing, all the frontline guys are playing. But I think Tony Adams is a guy that's going to really help take the secondary to the next level with his ball hawking skills. So C.J. Mosley is, you know, the captain of the defense. He's going to be where he needs to be playing in and play out. He's going to line up everybody. He's one of the smartest linebackers I've actually ever been around, just talking with him throughout the last two years. Um, so this defense is prime. I mean, I even talked about Quentin Williams. He has been unblockable for the whole training camp. You would, you know, you sometimes worry, you know, Jake, when somebody gets their money, how they react to that. And you would never know that Quentin Williams got a bag because he literally has been dominating practice, playing and play out cross practices. They haven't been able to block him, whether it was the Carolina Panthers or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So this defense was already a top four defense. Jake, I'm telling you right now, this is going to be a top two defense with the potential to not be a not not be number two. They have the potential to be the number one defense in football. That's how much skill set they have on that side of the ball. Leger, from your lips to God's ears, the Jets have the number one defense in the NFL this year. Of course, Leger Duzable, former Jets defensive lineman, is our guest here on 98.7 ESPN. New York, Jake Asman with you until midnight. Leger, let me ask you about just the idea that the Jets and the Giants play every year in the preseason. Robert Sala said earlier in the week, hey, look, it's not going to be the atmosphere of week one at MetLife against Buffalo but he wanted Aaron Rodgers to experience a night game at MetLife, and there's going to be some extra juice because it is the Giants. You played in a lot of those Jets-Giants preseason matchups. Is there more juice than a typical preseason game when those two uh, those two teams play? 
Oh, definitely, because this is usually always a dress rehearsal game. So, like, when I was playing, it was always the third preseason game. And now it's weird, right, because there's coaches that have so many, you know, so many different reasonings to what they want to do in regards to playing players in preseason, right? Yeah. Some guys use that game two as a dress rehearsal. Some teams are playing game three this week coming up as a dress rehearsal. The Jets are one of those teams. So this was always the Snoopy Bowl for us, right? It was always big. It's cross-time rival with the New York Giants, and we always wanted to win that game. So for one, your frontline guys are playing. So it, it gives you that real game atmosphere. Now, I know the Jets, I mean, the Giants are going to rest a lot of their guys, but the Jets are going to play all their frontline guys for the first time. So there'll be a little bit more juice in regards to that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. I think there's rumors that, you know, the starting offense may play two series, probably with the same thing with the, the starting defense, maybe two series, and then get them out of there. But it'd be good that, for them to go out there especially a guy like Aaron Rodgers to, to, to feel that, you know, that the New York crowd, right. Coming out at MetLife, understanding what it is. Cause the next time he does it, like you said, Jake, it will be Monday night football. And that's going to be a totally different atmosphere versus the divisional rival in the Buffalo bill. So this is a nice dress rehearsal for some of the frontline guys that haven't been here. The Randall Cobbs, the, you know, the Aaron Rodgers, the McCole Harmons, the Adrian Amos to feel what it's like to come out at MetLife you know, and be the home team and have the fans behind them. Lejay, just promise me, though, that, you know, Robert Sala won't pull a Rex Ryan, your former coach, and put Aaron Rodgers back out there late in the game if the Jets are trailing with backup <laughs> offensive linemen to try and That's win the Snoopy gonna, Bowl. That's never going to I mean, that was, that was weird. So that was – I want to say 2013. You're talking about Mark Sanchez, right? Yep. When he went and, back out there. He, and then Mark Gino came played, in as a rookie. Yeah, Mark hadn't played the whole game. And then randomly, I think he just put him in there in the third quarter. I think everybody thought, you know, Gino was going to take all the snaps. And then I'm trying to think who was the backup behind Mark. I don't know. Was it was it Matt? Might have been Matt Sims. I thought I think a lot of people thought Matt was going to take it the distance, but then he threw <laughs> he threw Mark out there, and then Mark ended up getting hurt and missing the whole season. So yeah, you don't have to worry about that with A.A. Ron. <laughs> A.A. Ron's taking one, maybe two series, and he's going to shut it down for the rest of the game. Sounds good to me. Leger Duzable is our guest here. It's Jake Asman with you, 98.7 ESPN New York. Leger, let's talk about the Giants now. Uh, they made a move. They acquired Isaiah Simmons in a trade. I know on Twitter you were high on this move. What do you think Isaiah Simmons can provide in Wink Martindale's defense? Well, the thing I'm interested in, Jake, is where is he going to play? And that's the thing about – Isaiah Simmons. He's always kind of been a positionless football player when it comes to defenses, right? And, and that's the thing about Wink Martindale. He kind of has a positionless defense. So Wink Martindale was high on this guy coming out of Clemson. And I guarantee he's probably going to use him to blitz a lot because Isaiah Simmons really took a step last year when they blitzed him off the edge and getting to the quarterback. And that's some of the things he did at Clemson, right? Um, there was rumors that he just wanted to play safety, but he didn't play that well at safety. I, I think Playing him at linebacker, we can use some athletic ability, you know, make some guards miss an open field, backdoor some blocks, and then blitz him on third down. That's where I think his strength is. And it'll be interesting to see how Wink Martindale implores his skill set in that defense. Because the one thing about Wink Martindale, he's going to bring that pressure kind of like Rex Ryan did, right? He's going to be he's gonna put, his, put his corners on the island, and he's going to bring that pressure. So it'll be interesting to see what they do because, you know, they, they did sign – Bobby Okariki this, this past offseason. He's played really well in the preseason. Where does Isaiah Simmons fit, you know, with the rest of that defense for the New York Giants? And how will Wink Martindale, you know, implore his skill set? Will he have a certain package just for Isaiah Simmons to do things that he does really well? I think that's what Wink Martindale can do. And I know he's giddy because he was really high on Isaiah Simmons coming out of college. We're talking with Leger Duzable, CBS Sports HQ, NFL analyst, 12-year NFL veteran. He's with us here on 98.7 ESPN. Finally, Leger, just big picture. Your thoughts on this Giants team? Last year, no one had them going to the playoffs. They go all the way to the divisional round. Your thoughts on the expectations now for the Giants under Brian Dable in his second year as the team's head coach? Yeah, high expectations. I think it's predicated off them trading for Darren Waller. And we kind of saw a little bit of that last week, what Darren Waller can look like in this offense. Great job by Mike Kafka scheming him up. They put him out wide. They put him, you know, in inline tight end position. They put him in a yo position just so he can have different mismatches. I mean, J.C. Horn was out there on the island with this dude, and Darren Waller just beast molded him on a slant route and got open and got a first down. So if Darren Waller can stay healthy, I mean, it'll be massive for Daniel Jones because if we look at this offense, right, and how the evolution of this offense has kind of changed, 
first eight weeks of the season, it was really based off of Saquon Barkley and running the football. But if you look at that back eight games of the season and into the playoffs, he kind of ran the offense as if he was back in Buffalo. I'm talking about Brian Dayball with Josh Allen. He put more trust in Daniel Jones. They ran the offense through Daniel uh, through Daniel Jones. And we saw that last week, right? They came out. I don't even believe they ran the ball the first series, right? They literally threw it almost every single time. And it kind of reminded you of like Buff the Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen type offense, right? So I think Mike Kafka is going to put a little bit more onus on Daniel Jones. And I think they're more comfortable now after they saw what they saw the back end of the season and then going up to Minnesota and winning the game. That game was fully on Daniel Jones. Like they entrusted him with everything. He had more rushing yards than Saquon Barkley, had more rushing attempts than Saquon Barkley. And still, I believe, threw for over 300 yards that game. So they put a lot of faith in Daniel Jones. It looks like it's going to be the ball, and no pun intended, is going to be in his court, and they're going to run the offense through him. But I think when you look at the rest of the NFC East, right, if there's one team I would say that maybe regresses, it is the Giants. I believe the Washington Commanders are going to take a step this year, right? They were beat up really bad last year, and they still had a top 10 defense. I mean, Jonathan Allen was missed a lot. Chase Young practically missed the whole season. He's highly motivated. Contract year. Montez Sweat, contract year. They go get a ball hawking corner in Emmanuel Forbes. And I really love what Eric Bieniemy has done with Sam Howe as far as the way he schemed things up. Yes, he came from Kansas City, but he's a running back at nature, right? So he's going to still run the ball with those two backs, Antonio Gibson and Brian Robinson. But he does a really good job spacing things out for Sam Howe so he has easy reads. I just love the spacing that I saw the first couple of preseason games. And then Sam Howe being efficient in knowing where to go with the football and then using his athletic ability when he needs to. So I think the Washington Commanders are going to be a sneaky team. I think the Giants may take a step back because they did win a lot of close games last year, a lot of one-score games last year. And we know that, Jake. It's hard to really replicate that year in and year out. So that's the thing I'm worried about, this Giants team. They're going to, they're going to be banking on a lot of young secondary help, right? Jason Pinnock is a guy I really like. He seems like he's going to be a starting safety back there next to McKinney. And then Deontay Banks, who they took in the first round, who had some handsy issues at Maryland, he's going to start at corner. So they got a young, very young secondary for a team that does, plays a lot of man coverage, zero and one coverage. Could be a long year on that defense if those young guys, you know, don't stand up to the task early in the season. He is Leger Doosable. My name is Jake Asman. Leger kind enough with his time here on a Friday night on the eve of Jets-Giants, the final preseason game for both teams at MetLife Stadium tomorrow night. LeJay, always great to catch up. Appreciate your time, and thanks so much for coming back on the show. Of course, Jake. Thanks for having me on. He's LeJay Doosable. My name is Jake Asman. More of your calls coming up to wrap up our show. It's 800-919-ESPN. That's the number. Jake Asman with you. You're on 98.7 ESPN New York.